Hi everyone, Mrs V here and today we are going to be learning how temperature can affect the rate of a chemical reaction. So let's get our PowerPoint on and let's get straight down to it. Today we're going to apply our knowledge of the collision theory of reactions to explain how increasing the temperature of reactants increases the rate of a chemical reaction. We'll also look at light intensity and the rate of photochemical reactions because that depends on much the same principle. Knowing which factors speed up reactions allows us to control the rate at which that reaction occurs. There's many applications for this in industry, but also in everyday life. In our previous video, we looked at the effect of concentration of reactants on the rate of reaction. Today, let's look at the temperature of reactants and how that affects the rate of reactions. Because it's based on the same ideas, we'll also talk about light intensity affecting the rate of photochemical reactions. We conducted an investigation into the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction in a previous video. We used the reaction between marble chips, which are calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid, and we measured the mass of carbon dioxide produced at various time intervals. We then changed the temperature of the hydrochloric acid. I've calculated the rate of carbon dioxide production in the first 30 seconds for each acid temperature and graphed those results. What we observe is that as the acid temperature increases, the rate of reaction also increases. The trend we observed was a linear increase, which was surprising as my reading suggested that every 10 degree increase in temperature approximately doubles the rate of reaction, and that would suggest an exponential increase. However, our observations didn't support this. We have data here that fits a linear trend very well, as we have our R squared value being very close to one. Now you remember from our collision theory video that in order to produce a reaction, a collision between molecules must occur with correct orientation to form new bonds and enough energy to break the existing bonds in the molecule. The scientific way we say this is that the sum of kinetic energy of the colliding particles must be greater than or at least equal to the activation energy for the reaction. The rate of a chemical reaction depends on how many of these effective collisions are occurring per second. Let's talk now about how increasing the temperature of the reactants can increase that rate of effective collisions. The first thing to realize is that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a particular substance. It's an average, so in any substance, some particles are moving faster than the average and some particles are moving slower than the average. Some particles will just be moving at that average kinetic energy. Increasing the temperature, though, is going to increase the average kinetic energy of the particles. So if we have a low temperature here, the particles are not moving as fast as if we had a high temperature. All the particles are moving faster, but there will still be some slower and some faster moving particles, but in general, all of them are going to be moving faster. Let's use that example of the people in a room. We've got them wearing blindfolds and earmuffs so they can't see or hear each other. And I'm gonna ask them to walk around randomly. They are going to collide with the walls and they're gonna collide with each other. Now I'm going to ask them, still with their blindfolds on and their earmuffs on, to run around randomly. Now these people are going to collide much more often with each other and they're also gonna bump into each other much, much harder. The same thing happens with molecules. When they're moving faster, they're going to collide more often and they're also gonna hit each other much harder. Of course, the scientific way to say this is that the collision has a higher sum of kinetic energy of the colliding particles. Colliding more often means that there will be a statistical increase in the effective collision rate, just like we saw with the concentration of reactants. Because there are more collisions and a certain percentage of them will be effective, we're gonna take that certain percentage of a larger number of collisions, which means we will have a larger number of, of effective collisions. But when you increase the temperature, all the particles also have more energy. And the particles having more energy means that it's much more likely that any given collision is going to be between particles that have enough energy to exceed the activation energy for the reaction. So you've got two different factors going on here and both of them are increasing the rate of the effective collisions. 
both are contributing to an increase in reaction rate. One graph that we see used to give a visual idea of how temperature affects reaction rate is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. What it shows is how there are different kinetic energies of particles in a sample at a particular temperature. So in this graph, all the particles are existing in a sample that's at the same temperature. But in the graph, we see that there's a few particles here that have really low energy. And there are also a few particles that have really high energy. But most of the particles have an intermediate or moderate amount of energy. As the temperature increases, the curve flattens out and moves a little bit to the right. The area under the curve represents the total number of particles, so that has to stay the same, which means if we're going to stretch it out to a higher energy at the higher temperature, we're going to have to have that peak of the graph come down a little bit. At the higher temperatures, we see there are more particles here that have high energy and less particles that have low energy. But within that sample, there are still particles with all the different range of kinetic energies in the sample. So if we're looking at a collision between particles in this sample, you could have a collision between two of the low energy particles. You could have a collision between two of the moderate energy particles, two of the high energy particles, or you could have a collision between one particle with low energy and one with moderate, one with low, one with high, one with moderate, one with high. So there is a range of sums of kinetic energies of colliding particles as well. The activation energy for a reaction can be marked on this distribution. So here we mark the activation energy for the reaction here. The particles beyond this line have enough energy to react. So this shaded area here are the particles that have enough energy to react. The particles before it in the blue region here don't have enough energy to react. So when they collide, those particles will just bounce off each other without reacting. Now, the larger the shaded area beyond the line, the higher the rate of reaction. So what we want is a large area beyond the activation energy. Here we can see that at a higher temperature, the shaded area beyond the activation energy is much larger. That's going to mean that we have more particles with sufficient energy to react, more effective collisions per second, and therefore a higher rate of reaction. At the lower temperature, the proportion of particles beyond the activation energy is lower, and that's going to lead to less effective collisions per second and a lower rate of reaction. So in summary, a higher temperature results in more collisions and also a greater proportion of those collisions being effective. So that's a double reason there for a higher rate of reaction. Let's have a look at photochemical reactions. A photochemical reaction only occurs in the presence of light. Light is your energy source that breaks the existing bond in the molecule that produces the transition state. The rate of a photochemical reaction is increased by increasing light intensity in the same way that if we increase temperature for thermochemical reactions, we get a higher rate of reaction. It's the same idea. Some examples of photochemical reactions, you might recognize this first reaction in which carbon dioxide and water is being converted into glucose and oxygen as photosynthesis. The second two reactions here are reactions that are involved in silver halide photography. This is the way photographs used to be produced before we took them digitally. And our fourth reaction here shows how oxides of nitrogen are often involved in photochemical reactions. In silver halide photography, the photographic film is coated with a thin layer of silver chloride or silver bromide emulsion. When you expose this to light, it deposits metallic silver and that darkens that area of the film. In the picture, we see that lighter areas of the original that reflect a lot of light, these are going to cause a higher rate of reaction in which the metallic silver is deposited than the darker areas. The areas become dark in the negative image. More silver has been deposited in these areas because of the higher rate of that photochemical reaction. Now that produces a negative image where the lighter areas appear dark 
and the darker areas appear light. When developing the film and producing the photograph, light is shone through the negative onto some photographic paper. Photographic paper is also coated with silver chloride or silver bromide. The dark parts of the negative image block the light, so that part of the paper is not as darkened by metallic silver, and the lighter parts of the negative allow more light through, so the rate of silver formation is higher and the paper is darkened more. This way, by going through the negative and then the positive image, we get a true image of what we took the photograph of. Photosynthesis is a really interesting photochemical reaction. Light is used to produce ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, which is an energy carrying molecule, and NADPH, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, which is an electron donating molecule. These two are necessary to fuel the second stage of photosynthesis, and that's the one in which we have the carbon dioxide reacting. If you increase the light intensity, then you're going to increase the rate of production of ATP and NADPH, but the rate of photosynthesis overall is also going to depend on the availability of carbon dioxide. If there's a limited supply of carbon dioxide, then it doesn't matter how much ATP and NADPH is formed. You still can't go any faster with that reaction because the carbon dioxide supply is not keeping up. So if we see in the graph here, initially the rate is proportional to the light intensity, but it falls off. And this is the point here where the carbon dioxide supply is not keeping up anymore. You've reached the limit of available carbon dioxide and the rate of photosynthesis then stabilizes. So there you have it. Increasing the amount of energy of the particles does increase the rate of reaction, but this still needs to be supported by the influence of the concentration of reactants. So a reaction is not always controlled just by one of the factors that affects the rate of reaction. That's all for today. If you found this video useful, if it really helped you understand how temperature affects the rate of a chemical reaction, then please give the video a like. And as always, please subscribe to my channel, watch more videos, and learn more about wonderful chemistry. I am going to see you guys in the next video.